All right, good morning. Go ahead and take your Bible, turn to Genesis chapter 24, and you're going to need to listen fast. We've got 67 verses to cover, so we're going to, we are going to haul loose. If you are visiting with us this morning, we're walking through the book of Genesis together, so that's why we find ourselves in Genesis 24. I hope you can find a Bible near you and find it and, and follow along with us. Let me also, uh, while you're finding your place, just wish everybody a happy Reformation Day. Listen, we need to praise the Lord for what took place over 500 years ago. Uh, we are here worshiping the way we do because of that. And so we praise God for the way he works out his plans according to his purposes. Let me also ask everybody uh, to take this card out of your worship folder. Guests, if you would consider filling out your information on the front so we can get acquainted with you, everybody, guests and members alike, would you please consider filling out a prayer need? You can leave these in your seat on your way out, or you can also just drop them in the offering basket uh, as you exit. We appreciate your help with that. Please kind of glance through the worship folder with all the information in it, various items to be of interest. Certainly tonight, uh, the trunk or treat. Go ahead and read through that paragraph. Make sure you're in, time, uh, in the right spot in time, uh, and let's pray that the Lord will help us just connect with our community. Let me also mention one thing. I know it's not in here, uh, but there is a sign-up for it. Men, uh, if you are interested in uh, things like hunting and uh, carving up deer and eating meat, you will be interested in uh, an event that the men's ministry is putting on next week, I believe. There's information about it where we will learn how to process a deer. Don't even know if that's the right way to put it. Uh, but that's, that's what I understand. And so there's a sign-up for it on the men's ministry table back there. So just want you aware of that. So here's what I want us to do. I'm going to have a brief prayer. Uh, I want you to listen to the prayer because it really is going to show the summary of the text. We'll actually revisit the prayer about two-thirds of the way through the sermon. But would you, would you bow your heads and just agree with this prayer, and then we will get into the text. God, I ask that you will anchor us in our faith since you have fulfilled your covenant promises in your Son. We also ask that you would carry us in our faith as you forward your covenant promises through us. We pray this by your Spirit, in the name of your Son. Amen. 67 verses. Put your seatbelt on. Let me go ahead and give you a little summary of what we're going to look at. We're going to watch Abraham's faith. In verses 1 through 9, we're going to watch his faith in action. Then we're going to see his servant's faith in action in verses 10 through the first part of verse 54. Then we're going to see Rebecca's faith in action. Hopefully we will be encouraged and challenged. Why don't you follow along, verse 1. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years. As I often do, I will make comments as we go. Let's just kind of take this in. We've already been told he's old before. I mean, he's getting up there, y'all. Bible's telling us again he is old. He is so old, I realize this week... Y'all would kick him out of a salt luncheon. He's too old. Okay? The Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. You hear echoes of chapter 12, verse 2, when God called Abram. He said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make you a blessing. Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. All right, go ahead and just embrace the awkwardness. We don't have to ignore it. I'm not going to do that to Kyle and Matt. I'm not going to make them come into my office and do this, but this was a way of making an oath. He says, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. Let's make sure we're all caught up here. Let's just say this is just maybe your first week here. Maybe you're not familiar with the, the story of Genesis, but God called Abram, and one of the promises that he gave Abram, 
who would later be named Abraham, a father of a multitude, is that through Abraham's offspring, all of the families, all of the nations of the earth would be blessed. There was one massive problem. He and his wife Sarah were already old and didn't have a son. Finally, they had a son Isaac. Abraham realizes some things need to happen in order for more offspring to come along. He's got to find this man a wife. Verse 5, the servant said to him, Perhaps a woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Now listen to Abraham's faith. Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me to your offspring I will give this land, he will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. That is Abraham speaking by faith. He's saying, no, we were called away from the homeland. We're not going back. We're called to the promised land. We cannot go back. He's saying, God will send his angel to make this happen. That's faith. But then listen to him express faith in another way. Verse 8, but if the woman is not willing to follow you. In other words, he's saying, okay, let's just humor your concern. It's a valid concern. Let's say you can't find a woman who wants to come here to Canaan. If the woman is not willing to follow you, listen to his faith. Then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. You say, well, how is that faith? Because somehow Abraham knows God is going to fulfill his promises. Even if someone else is not willing to walk in that path. He tells his servant, whatever you do, don't take us away from the promises. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, swore to him concerning this matter. I want us to be encouraged for just a brief moment that we can witness in Abraham a man who has matured in his faith. We've seen him make mistakes leading up to this point. That's encouraging because you and I have made some mistakes. And yet we see that he has matured in his faith. Or he knows, no, whatever we do, we must do according to the promises that God has given us in his covenant. Now let's see the servant's faith in action, verse 10. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. Lest we read too quickly, take that picture in ten camels loaded up with riches. This is quite a scene. He arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. You may remember from last week, that is Abraham's brother. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening. The time when women go out to draw water. I want to tell you this. This is the first of multiple scenes in the Bible that take place at a well where betrothals occur. Very important scene. It's a template. We'll see how it can be used as a template in a few moments. Verse 12, he says, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Now, if you like to write in your Bible, you may want to note the phrase steadfast love. We're going to hear it four times. Very important term. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water. The daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink, and who shall say drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown, here it is again, steadfast love to my master. So he's praying to God, look, I'm going to ask for a drink. And I want one of these young ladies to say, please drink and let me water your camels also. And let that be the sign that this is the woman for Isaac. 
Look at verse 15. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother. Now, here is Bible's way of slapping us across the face. Like, wake up! Why do I say that? Look at chapter 22, verse 23. Let's just back up. Chapter 22, verse 20. Remember this from last week. Go ahead and find it. Chapter 22, verse 20. After these things it was told to Abraham, Behold, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor, Uz his firstborn, Buzz his brother, Kemuel the father of Aram, Kesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlap, and Bethuel. Bethuel fathered Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. And the Bible today is smacking us across the face by just reiterating all this. Before the servant finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. Now remember, we're being told this information. The servant does not know all this. We get to watch him learn who this is. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, Drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said... I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew for all his camels. And let me explain, this is quite a feat. Apparently a camel could hold 25 gallons of water. She is having to scoop up. 250 gallons of water. Can you imagine? I mean, back and forth, back and forth. This took some gusto for Rebecca to be able to do this. Some of us, in trying to save money, will fill our boats with gas that we go get at the gas station and we carry in five-gallon buckets to save money. Do that two or three times, and you say, honey, it might be worth it to spend $1,000 and just fill it up at the lake. She is going back and forth. Look at what happens. The man gazed at her in silence. He's just watching her, sipping his cup of water while she's going back. I mean, what a gentleman, right? But he's gazing at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing half shekel, several ounces, two bracelets for her arms weighing ten gold shekels, and said, please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, here he's going to learn who this is. I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah whom she bore to Nahor. She added, we have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord and said, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsmen. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. You ever have one of those moments where you just know God just worked things out in an extraordinary way? That's what the servant of Abraham is going through. Like, what can you believe that God worked it out just like this? Verse 29, Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban. Laban ran out toward the man to the spring. We're going to learn about Laban here. We're going to learn about his character, and it will come into play in a few chapters. Laban ran out toward the man to the spring as soon as he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's arms and heard the words of Rebekah, his sister. Thus the man spoke to me. He went to the man. He saw the gold. He was intrigued. Behold, he, that's Abraham, that's Abraham's servant, was standing by the camels at the spring. He, that's Laban, said, Come in, O blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside? For I prepared the house and a place for the camels. 
So the man came to the house and unharnessed the camels. I want you to imagine how long this may have taken. Unharnessed the camels, gave straw and fodder to the camels. There was water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Then food was set before him to eat. All this time going by, he's, he's tired, he's hungry, he's worn out. But he says, I will not eat until I've said what I have to say. He is urgent about the task at hand. And Laban says, speak on. He wants to know what the man has to say. Speak on, Mr. Gold Giver. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. Now, listen to this from the viewpoint of Rebekah's family. The servant lays it on thick. How can you say no to what the servant says? I am Abraham's servant. The Lord has greatly blessed my master and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male servants and female servants, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son, one son to my master when she was old. And to him he has given all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites. In whose land I dwell, but ye shall go to my father's house and to my clan and take a wife for my son. I said to my master, Perhaps the woman will not follow me, but he said to me, The Lord, before whom I have walked, will send his angel with you and prosper your way. You shall take a wife for my son, from my clan, and from my father's house. Then you will be free from my oath when you come to my clan, and if they will not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. I came today to the spring and said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, if now you are prospering the way that I go, behold, I am standing by the spring of water. Let the virgin who comes out to draw water, to whom I shall say, please give me a little water from your jar to drink, and who will say to me, drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom the Lord has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, he said, behold, Rebecca came out with her water jar on her shoulder. She went down to the spring and drew water. I said to her, please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, drink, and I will give your camels drink also. So I drank, and she also, she gave the camels drink also. Then I asked her, whose daughter are you? She said, the daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose. And the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you, watch what he does here, if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, we've been hearing about God's steadfast love and faithfulness. Now he's turned the tables. He looked. Now, if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. How are they going to say no to this? I prayed and I gave gold and Abraham said this and I've come all this way. And did you see all the camels and everything that is loaded on their backs? And do you know about a God of steadfast love and faithfulness? Now, if you're going to show that, how are they going to say no? Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said... The thing has come from the Lord. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. I can't help but wonder throughout the week, what if we did that more? Like, What if we just worshipped in the moment more? This would be awkward for us. He was so grateful for God's confirmation, for God's blessing, for God working out His plan, that before these people He'd never met, He bowed His face to the ground to worship the Lord. The servant brought out jewelry of silver and of gold and garments, and He gave them to Rebekah. He also gave to her brother and to her mother costly ornaments. And He and the men who were with Him ate and drank and they spent the night there. And we've watched the servant's faith in action, doing what his master called him to do, knowing that God 
Yahweh himself would fulfill his plans. Here's what I want us to do at this point in the text. I just want us to enjoy God's steadfast love and faithfulness. Over and over, that is reiterated. And the Bible repeats something, we want to pay attention to it. God's steadfast love and faithfulness, his faithfulness means his truth, that he is true. His steadfast love is this way of saying that he is good and he is kind. And I want you to enjoy that truth right now. Listen, God is true, God is good, and think about this, God is kind. He's kind. I had a conversation this week where we were talking about how young guys who are just kind catch the eyes of young ladies. They're just looking for someone who's kind, right? Because there's something about that. God is kind. We forget that from time to time, I think. Yes, he is all powerful. Yes, he's all knowing. Yes, he's the king. Yes, he's the judge. None of that is taken away by also realizing he is kind. And I just wonder. Who needs to be reminded of that this morning? He's a God of steadfast love and faithfulness. He's good to you. He's kind to you. You're sitting in here this morning because God is so kind to us. We should worship him for that. Let's see Rebecca's faith in actions. Pick back up in the middle of verse 54. When they arose in the morning. Find that phrase to to be on track. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. Her brother and her mother said, let the young woman remain with us a while, at least 10 days. After that, she may go. But he said to them, do not delay me. Since the Lord has prospered my way, send me away that I may go to my master. A little tension here. Let's see how this unfolds. They said, well, let us call the young woman and ask her. They called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? She said, I will go. That's faith. She is leaving. She's not coming back. Think about this. She's not just now meeting her husband. She's meeting a guy who's telling her about the guy that would be her husband, and she's wanting to go. So they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant, and his men. And they blessed Rebecca and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands. And may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Just take this in. This blessing reads like a prophecy. May you become thousands of ten thousands. Just try to do the math. Thousands of ten thousands. May your offspring Possess the gate of those who hate him. This may sound familiar. Go to chapter 22, find verse 17. In chapter 22, verse 17, Abraham just showed he was willing to sacrifice Isaac, his one and only son whom he loved. This is one of the things that God said to him. I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. In other words, Thousands of ten thousands of offspring, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. It's the same thing that Rebecca hears. Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands. May your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Then Rebecca and her young women arose and rode on the camels and followed him. Thus the servant took Rebecca and went his way. Now Isaac had returned from Beer Lahai Roy. And was dwelling in the Negev. And this just hit me this week. He's coming from Beer, Lahai, Roy. That word beer means well. Isaac's been at a well too. Isaac's been at the well where his mother's servant encountered the angel of the Lord. And his father's servant has just been at a well where the angel of the Lord led him to his bride comes from Beer Lahai Roy, dwelling in the Negev. And Isaac went out to meditate in his field, in the field toward evening. He lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. Try to hear this as if you're watching the movie unfold. This is like romance to the core. He lifts up his eyes. He sees camels coming. Rebecca lifted up her eyes. 
She saw Isaac. Maybe their eyes locked. We may never know. She dismounted from the camel, said to the servant, Who is that man walking in the field to meet us? Now, we don't know her tone, but hopefully it sounds like she's interested. The servant said, listen to what he says. The servant says, it is my master. He didn't say it's my master's son. It is my master. There's a changing of the guard taking place. So she took her veil and covered herself. That was a a, a signal that she was a potential bride. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah. Now she is taking the place of Sarah. She became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So let's try to take in the big picture. What is going on? Let me summarize what's going on. God is fulfilling and forwarding his covenant promises through Isaac and Rebekah. He's fulfilling covenant promises. For example, we go back and we read verse 7. This is what Abraham said. The Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you. You shall take a wife from my son there. That's one example in this text where we see God is fulfilling his covenant promises that he gave Abraham. Isaac has to have a wife. They have to have children in order for all these promises to unfold. God is fulfilling his covenant promises. He is forwarding his covenant promises when they say to Rebekah, our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands. That is a declaration of hope for the future. May your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. God is now forwarding his covenant promises through Isaac and Rebekah. They are now the recipients of God's covenant. This is the summary that informed my prayer at the beginning. I pray, God, anchor us in our faith since you have fulfilled your covenant promises in your Son. Carry us in our faith as you forward your covenant promises through us. This is why Genesis 24 matters to us because as God continued to forward his covenant promises, he fulfilled those covenant promises through his Son, The son of God, the son that Isaac, the son of promise, was pointing forward to. So we hear in Galatians 3.16, now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. Paul says this, it does not say unto offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one and to your offspring, who is Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of Genesis chapter 24. Christ is the fulfillment of may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. I want you to go to John chapter 4. Take the time to go there with me. I want to read John 4. I would imagine 95% of us are familiar with this story. Remember what I said about Genesis 24. It's the beginning of a certain kind of scene in the Bible. A scene that takes place at a well. A scene where a potential husband and wife meet. John chapter 4, verse 3. Follow along with me. He left, that's Jesus. He left Judea and departed again for Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. And I want you to try to hear, just try to hear all the echoes of Genesis 24. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. It was noon, unlike when Abraham's servant arrived in the evening time. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. 
Compare and contrast with Genesis 24. Abraham's servant asked for a drink. She says, absolutely, let me water your camels also. Here, Jesus asked for a drink. She says, why are you asking me for a drink? You're a man, I'm a woman. You're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. This is scandalous. And she doesn't offer to give him more water. He offers to give her more water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? She is making a mistake that we often make. We only think on the surface level, the physical realm. She's about to learn a spiritual lesson. Look at what she asks in verse 12. Are you greater than our father Jacob? There's a lot of irony in here. Are you greater than our father, Jacob? Well, let me remind you who Jacob's father is, Isaac. And I just told you that Isaac was only pointing forward to a coming son. That's Jesus, the son of God. She's like, are you greater than our father, Jacob? He can say, yes, I am, which he kind of does in his own way. She explains, Jacob gave us the well and drank for himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, here's how we know she's not listening from a spiritual perspective. She says, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Let me ask you before I keep reading, are you thirsty? I'm asking spiritually, are you thirsty? Let's see how Jesus handles the thirsty. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered to him, I have no husband. Now he just pushed the button. Jesus just went straight to the source of her thirst. She says, I have no husband. He says to her, you're right in saying you have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Are you thirsty this morning? Let Jesus go straight to the source of your thirst. Think about this. He says, yep, you're right. You don't have a husband. Matter of fact, you've had five husbands. And the one that you're with isn't even your husband. Six. And she just met a man named Jesus at a well. The complete man. Number seven. Now fast forward to verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Listen to the gospel this morning. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the source of living water, abundant water, eternal life-giving water. He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. That means he was the anointed one. Kings were anointed in the Old Testament. He's the king of kings, and he came to be the kind of king that no one anticipated. He came to be the Messiah who would die on the cross for our sins and rise from the grave. If you're not a follower of Jesus, hear the gospel. Jesus came and died for you. That's how much he loved you. He rose from the grave. With his power, he offers you living water. From an eternal wellspring that doesn't run out. Are you thirsty? You come to Jesus to be satisfied. That's the gospel. God has fulfilled his covenant promises through his son. But on top of that, church members, especially believers, listen. God is forwarding his covenant promises through us. He's not done. He's not done fulfilling his promises. There's more for him to fulfill. The story is not yet finished. He's forwarding his promises through us. Listen to what Jesus, the Christ, said in Matthew 16, verse 18. He says, I will build my church, 
and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is going to fulfill the very prophecy that was proclaimed over Abraham, the very blessing proclaimed over Rebekah. The gates of hell will not stop the church of Jesus Christ. He is forwarding his promises through us. Listen again. Many times we've read this text. Revelation 7 verse 9. I looked. Behold. A great multitude that no one could number. In other words, thousands of ten thousands. From every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. And John tells us. They were crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God. That's where we're going. It is where we are going. You're a follower of Christ. You'll be part of a multitude that no one could number. Thousands of ten thousands of people from every nation, every tribe, every people, every language. And we will be praising God for salvation. So here's what I want us to do this morning. Two things. I want to give you just a broad encouragement, and then we're going to do something very specific in response. Number one, I want you to celebrate. Like moving forward from this place this morning, I want you to go, I want you to celebrate with faith from God's fulfillment. I want you to celebrate that we can look back and see how God has been faithful and true and good and kind, fulfilling all of his promises. Let me ask you this, do you see any evidence of the gospel being fulfilled in your life? Any thinking this morning about this, and I realize on my good days, in my good moments, I say, yes, I see so much evidence of God fulfilling his gospel promises in my life, in my family's life, in this church family's life. I mean, it's overwhelming, but let me be honest, and maybe this helps you, maybe this encourages you. There are down days. There are tough moments where I say, I think so. I think I see evidence of God fulfilling his covenant promises. This is why we need God's word. This is why we need worship. This is why God wants us to come week after week and celebrate, be reminded that there is evidence all around us of God fulfilling his covenant promises. If you'd let me preach longer, I'd give you 30 minutes worth of evidence. But you won't, your fault, so hey. Come up with your own examples, I guess. I want us to celebrate. By the way, I could. I could give us, I mean, God is so good to this church. I want us to celebrate. I want us to participate. God, forget what I want. God wants us to participate. He wants us to participate with faith towards God's future. So we celebrate with faith from God's fulfillment. We participate with faith toward God's future. Let me ask you this. Do you feel any desire for God's future? Any? On my good days and my good moments, I say, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. On the tough days and the challenging moments, I say, I think so. I think so. Maybe you're somewhere in that spectrum. Let's, Let's ask God to grow our desire for his future. It is so good. I mean, we have no idea. We were praying this morning in my office. We have no idea what heaven will be like. I mean, we, yes, we have some idea. I, I don't want to shortcut the fact God has revealed a certain amount of information about heaven. But let's be honest. Like, we, we, we don't know what to expect. It's going to overwhelm us in the most wonderful ways. Do we desire everything that God wants to do through us, in us, by us, according to his power, from here to that point. And I can tell you, in my best days, I mean, yes. Some days maybe I'm like, I think so. I'm just aware of my own shortcomings, of my own indifference, of my own hesitation, whatever it is. But let me tell you, God's desires for us are so good. I want us to participate in them. I want us to celebrate and I want us to participate. One of the best ways to do that is something we're going to do now. Hopefully as you walked in, you received the elements for communion. I want you to take those. 
I have to admit, I cheat, so I already opened up mine. You have to open up yours now, so good luck. While you're doing that, take your time, don't rush it. Let me explain what we are about to do to those who may not be familiar. We are, we're going to close the sermon this morning in a very special way. We're going to celebrate the gospel and participate in the gospel in a very special way. God's word gives us instructions to remember that Jesus died on the cross in our place. And as we remember, we look forward to his return. So we're going to observe communion. If you're not a follower of Christ, here's what I would ask you not to do. Don't do this. You may have, you may have taken the, the cup on your way in, which is fine. I want to ask you not to do this if you're not a follower of Christ. I want you to watch us do it. Now, in one sense, it's not very spectacular. We're going to take this little wafer thing and a little bitty plastic cup of juice, and we're going to eat and drink. It may almost look silly. It's so simple. And yet it is one of two very powerful pictures of the gospel that the Bible tells us to paint, baptism and communion. I want you to watch us. If you're not a follower of Christ, watch us celebrate what Jesus has done. Watch us participate in what he has done for us. And I believe God uses this to show you your need for him. I want you to listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Chapter 11, verse 23. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Paul goes on to say this. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. Saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I want to close by reading to you the very next verse. Paul reminds us, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'd ask you to stand as we respond to God's word. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask me? Side. Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whatever befall me, Jesus do with all. Things well, for I know whatever befall me, Jesus do with all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial. Feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary 
steps may falter and my soul a thirst may be gushing from the rock before me lo a spring of joy i see gushing from the rock before me lo a spring of joy i see and all the way my savior leads me oh the fullness of his love perfect rest to me is promised in my father's house above when my spirit clothed immortal wings its flight to realms of day this my song through endless ages jesus led me all the way this my song through endless ages jesus led me all the way receive your benediction from the words of proverbs chapter 3 verses 1 through 6 my son do not forget my teaching but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will make straight your paths. Amen.